I'm the director of the Undergraduate Laws Program, and I and Dr. Keith Sharp, who's the director of the EMFSS suite of programs, will be, in a sense, chairing today's or this morning's session and the session following the break. I'm aware that this is a very general session. It's not one that's focusing on the challenges facing individual programs. So what Dr. Sharp and I thought we would do is to set out what we see as some of the major challenges that we're all facing and that we're aware of here in the UK. But then we wanted to have an open discussion with yourselves about what you see to be the challenges and what you see the opportunities to be because we recognise how important you, our institutions, are. You're absolutely vital to the work that we do. So we are really concerned that we get a good understanding of the issues that you're facing and also that you understand the broader environment in which we are working as well. So what I wanted to do was just to set out what I see as the, the scene for higher education, uh, transnational higher education at the moment, looking in particular around issues, if you like, of quality and the student experience, and my colleague Dr Sharp will be focusing on competition and institutions. But I think my perspective is that higher education is really at a crossroads. There's the rapid pace of globalisation, uh, an increasingly integrated world economy, the dominance of English language, the increased mobility of students and academics, and the increased mobility of programs and institutions as we're witnessing in a number of markets now. More and more foreign institutions are moving into those particular markets. At the same time, we've got tremendous growth in ICT, information and communication technologies. We now have emails, social media, blogs, webcasts, learning management systems such as VLEs, electronic publications, MOOCs, and I believe we're about to now face M-learning. So it won't be e-learning, it's M-learning, the use of mobile uh, for learning systems. So there's tremendous and rapid change around the world and a new generation of students who are expecting to be supported by these kinds of technologies. And it's how we use those technologies to support what we do for them, but also to support what you do for them. And that's really crucial for us that we get that kind of understanding as to what you see the role for ICT to be. We've also got <clears throat> the massification of higher education. In some countries in the world now, I believe that 80% um, of the population have got a, a higher ed degree. So we're seeing the massification of higher education, which is putting tremendous pressure on public funding and on universities to find new sources of funding through the commercialization of higher education. That's also putting pre pre uh, pressure on the professions, as I know all too well. It's putting pressure on local uh, legal professions who are starting to say we are facing too much competition. Um, so we've, we've got the, the responses of the professions for those of us who are involved in, in professional education in the higher education sector. We've also got an increasingly <coughs> diversified student population. It can't be assumed now that our student population are simply going to be school leavers. In some markets, they are, but in other markets, I'm using the language of the market here, I apologise for that, I, I really shouldn't because I object to it myself. Um, but in some of our countries, we're seeing an increasingly diversified student population. But as I said, we're aware that this isn't true in every country. So we've got different types of students in different countries. In some countries, it's very much a school leaver population that is studying our programme. In other countries, it's very much a graduate, entry, a graduate entrant population that's studying. So how do we support both types of students, or all types of students? We're also aware here in the UK, and I'm aware it's also a phenomenon in, in some other countries, we have the rise of the student as a consumer. Students now see themselves as consumers of education. Some, I suspect, would go so far as to say they are a purchaser of education. Um, and I always remember a nice story that the um, student ombudsman in Scotland used to tell when students would complain that they'd paid their money and not got a first class degree. And she used to reply to them saying, well, it's, it's not like that. It's more like joining a gym. You might join a gym to get fit. You pay your fees, but how fit you get at the end of the day is entirely up to you, the person who's paid the membership. So I try telling <coughs> students that these days, but we are certainly facing a rise in the attitude amongst consumers in some countries that they are consumers of education, 
and that they have very definite rights, and sometimes those rights extend to getting a particular classification of degree. There's also increasing emphasis, I think, on the student experience following on from that last comment. And certainly here in the UK, and, and Dr Stephanie Wilson, who's our expert on quality assurance, I'm sure would be able to offer more comments on this, but the student voice is becoming extremely important for quality assurance agencies. Uh, they, are wanting to, they are wanting to ensure that students have a voice in the educational experience that they are receiving. So we're having to accommodate the student voice as well, quite rightly. But at the same time, there's a concern about value added of higher education. It's not so much today simply about getting a degree, it's about what value does that degree add to the local or the regional or the global economy. So governments are also looking at that particular factor around value added of degrees. Then there's the rapidly changing job market for students or for graduates. There's a lot less stability in the job market now. And increasingly, students need to develop skills, knowledge, and attributes so that they can function in an increasingly complex and fluid and uncertain job market. So I think there's a, an increasing view that students need to be generalists rather than specialists these days. And they need to have acquired during their higher education the skills of creativity, critical thinking, and the ability to absorb greatly expanded quantities of information than ever before. In fact, there's a colleague at the Institute of Education who's written a lot about the fact that we're no longer in a, a complex world, we're in a super complex world. When it's not simply a case of being able to absorb lots of information if only we had the time, it's that what even counts as knowledge is now up for grabs and that students increasingly these days need to know how to assess knowledge, not just to know knowledge. There's also a shift away in the Western model from simply covering, if you like, declarative knowledge, making sure that we cram knowledge into students' heads that they can then repeat back to us. It's about encouraging functional knowledge so that students can take the knowledge that they've acquired and apply it in what could be quite a diverse range of occupations now. So I think the result is that quality of education in the broader sense will continue to be a major preoccupation for governments and that that preoccupation with quality is now almost universal. The trouble that we have is it's really difficult to, to define what we mean by quality. And so what we're seeing, I think, increasingly is the use of performance indicators and outcome measures uh, as proxies for quality. So we are very conscious of the need to focus on performance indicators and outcome measures. Against this sort of changing international or global environment, we've also got government regulators in the form of, for example, university grants commissions or ministries for, edu for higher education and their particular views about the purpose of higher education within their country. And we've also got professional regulatory bodies as well who might sometimes have a very different view from the government regulator, the higher education regulator, about the purpose of higher education and who should be admitted to the professions. The extent to which they rely on each other or they operate alongside each other or they operate across each other can vary for, from country to country and I know uh, for law that's particularly problematic and is becoming increasingly uh, problematic as we now have more and more graduates law graduates looking to enter the market and we're seeing sometimes two different approaches within the one country. Uh, we might want the, the, the government might be saying we want more lawyers, the profession might be saying we want less lawyers. So it's how we manage those tensions which can be quite different in different countries. Here in the UK, the legal profession, for example, has now announced that in future it's going to rely more on the UK Quality Assurance Agency for its quality assurance processes for the law degree. So at least we're seeing some synergy there. Um, but that might not be the, uh, the case in all countries. So I think, in, in summary, my view is this makes for a, a tremendously complicated and complex picture. And it presents real challenges for us that we really need to make sure that we here in London understand. But it probably also, I'm sure, presents opportunities and what we need to be able to <coughs> work together on is how we maximise those opportunities in the hugely diverse market that we face. Thank you.